And thank you everyone for attending this morning. I know that it's Monday morning, early, bright and early, but thank you for coming. Uh, now we were going to discuss the Universal Design for Learners, the toolkit. That's what we had published, a document that we had created uh, as part of a policy, a new education policy. It, there's a lot of information in there, so we just really wanted to see what's actually in there and how maybe we can actually help you in your education program from here on out as it relates to the education policy uh, for uh, reaching most of the marginalized people in the population, including children with disabilities. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that this is one of two series, so this, this webinar. Uh, we have three other choices. Uh, and you can actually look at the email again and choose what you would like to come to. So just wanted to let you know that this is the first part. I think maybe before we start, I want to ask all of you, uh, I'm just curious what your opinion is. And please be honest. And you can type in the chat box uh, what your opinion is and answer this question. How fluent do you think children with disabilities can become with literacy skills? Okay, I see some people said 100%, high fluency. Yes, I think that's really great. I mean, I'm happy that many of you perceive children with disabilities can actually become fluent. Now, before we go in, I'd like to introduce some of the people who um, are on the webinar today. My name is Josh Josa. I am a disability inclusion education specialist here in the Office of Education. Here with me, I have two presenters. You wanna introduce yourself, Rebecca? Uh, this is Rebecca Rhodes. I'm the team lead for reading and literacy at USAID E3S. And I have uh, other person here, actually, who's the lead author for the toolkit. And this is Anne. You'd like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi. My name is Anne Hayes, and I was a consultant on the toolkit and uh, have worked in inclusive education for, for about uh, 20 years. Okay, great. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and dive in to the first session for today. So uh, the first session really gives you information and background uh, related to universal design, for, universal design for learning and literacy skills. This session really is specifically about children who have disabilities, and I wanted to let you know that this is not only for children with disabilities. Universal design is for learners is for, can apply to all children without disabilities or with. The toolkit, why it's really needed uh, is because we all know that literacy has is issues with many children all over the world, not just children with disabilities. But uh, the fact is that about 90% of children who have disabilities in lower middle income countries do not even go to school. And those that are in school, uh, they get really substandard access to education. And therefore, their reading and literacy skills are obviously substandard. And when we look at disability community, we really can see uh, there's many, many different types of disabilities. And they have their own unique needs that are included with those disabilities. For one example would be deaf and hard of hearing children. There's only about one or 2% of those deaf children that have access to education with sign language. Uh, the same goes for children, students uh, that need assistive technology. There's probably about five to 15% have access to that, access to technology which means maybe they can't access to improve their literacy skills globally. Uh, the next thing we look at is in intersectionality of disabilities. Now, I remember that the disability doesn't mean that we have one. Maybe they have uh, a person might have intellectual disabilities plus being blind or dual disabilities. So children with intellectual disabilities and many disabilities in that group, often most are marginalized from education and disadvantaged. Uh, the toolkit really attempts to try to give people more tools and resources to address those challenges. We've been discussing children with disabilities and why is it so important to teach them and where is it important to teach them. So really what's important now is we get away from that model and we discuss how we can actually teach them. You know, we all agree it's important for children with disabilities to get education, that's understood, but how are we going to do that? 
many people still struggle to answer that question. So the toolkit attempts to answer those, those questions. And we recognize that most uh, early, le early grade reading programs uh, all over the world, they fail to meet those children with disabilities needs for literacy. Now, we also know that in general, children without disabilities, they struggle as well. So this toolkit tries to impact both of those populations. Uh, and we recognize that many programs still aren't fully aligned with the UN Universal Rights with People with Disabilities, the UN CRPD. So this toolkit, really the purpose for this is for the USAID mission staff and other people, education, ministers of education, program implementers, uh, literacy experts, families of children who have disabilities, disabled people organization, there's many people that it can actually apply to and beyond just this list as well. And again, this toolkit, what's in this toolkit and the universal divine for learning policy principle, not just for children with disabilities, but really it's for, it can impact all children. So on this list, there's actually different students that could benefit from this toolkit. And as you will see, uh, it impacts pretty much everybody globally. People who uh, have in, in, in neurodiverse, that means maybe they have an intellectual disability all the way to students that are gifted and talented. So that's a wide range of students and they have their own unique needs. And the teachers have those skills that they need to meet, that they need to meet those needs. There's blind, low vision, deaf blind, deaf and hard of hearing, uh, emotional learning, attention def deficit, girls, boys. I mean, it's just everything in between. So most of this uh, crisis and conflict region. So it's a little bit how this toolkit itself can organize, how it's organized. We have four chapters for this webinar series. Uh, we wanted to let you know that uh, for the first webinar today, that we will cover chapter one and two and four. So chapter three actually is related to phases of reading literacy and it's very, very dense. So we wanna make sure that we have enough time for that discussion another time. So we're moving it to the second webinar. So what is universal design learning? I mean, can anyone try to explain it? I know the slide says it, but anyone can try to explain it in their own words what UDL means. Any volunteers? Okay, great, that's fine. Um, that's why we're here, because we're trying to learn. We have actually three categories uh, for universal design, design for learning. The first category is multiple means of engagement. The reason for that is how we can actually motivate these students to respond so they can engage uh, with the teachers in different ways. This means giving them something like a reward system, for, for example. Uh, next is the second category. Uh, we have multiple means of, of representation, and that's related to how information is given in different ways. It could mean maybe writing on the board or having number system, maybe having one bump that equals one, and then maybe have another bump that equals two, so we, people can actually feel someone more tactile. And then they have, we have Braille as well. That could be another example in that category. So the point is to be able to give these students different ways that they can actually learn the information and receive it. The next category uh, is multiple means of action and expression. So that relates to opportunities for students to be able to express what they already have learned in different ways. Maybe they could do it through speech, maybe sign or writing, drawing, uh, typing it on a computer. Uh, there is different ways to do that, but those are the three categories. Um, we have a scale that has a little bit more information. There's actually nine categories that goes more in depth, uh, but we're not gonna dive into that right now. But the toolkit does have that information there, and it is online at CAST. Uh, that's their guidelines, and this very it's a lot more in in depth there. So, but the big picture is the USDL. It's a framework for what students, different students, what their needs are to make sure that it's effective and including all of them to be able to learn and express what they've learned. So, literacy, rigid meanings for what literacy is reading and writing, but 
people have actually envisioned this as a book, looking at a book and reading and then writing with a pen and a paper or a pencil, of course. And, and that was it. But really what literacy is, it needs, needs to happen is to become very flexible. It needs to allow for multiple sensory approaches. They can use different uh, ways. They could use technology or maybe an old fashioned way, reading and writing, but it's able to communicate and to learn receptively what's going on. We could do it through science, through speech, through technology, uh, braille. There's different ways to get the information to learn. So the toolkit is based on these core principles for literacy. And we just want to make sure that these students are be able to get those and become confident. Uh, we want to build on those students' strengths, make sure that they're not, oh, you, you know, you can't hear or you can't see. So, oh, sorry, too bad you can't be able to read because you, you can't see. You can't see the information or you can't speak because you can't hear. What they, You have to go on what they can do, what their strengths are. It doesn't matter what the disability is, but you can, maybe you can use whatever necessary to be able to play on their strengths. And you, there's evidence-based uh, instructional practices in there, and that's very important. Provide this positive attitude and to work with teachers with these students to make sure that what they teach and what the process is is cultural relevant as well. Uh, disability community has their own culture uh, that they ha that has to be considered, and in that country's culture and the context there. So that also has there's a balance and it's very layered. And like I mentioned before intersectionality, uh, that's also included, gender, identity. So we just need to make sure that gender equality is there, LGBT, all these different uh, kinds of things that are margin, people that are marginalized and identified, we need to include them. And most important of all is to make sure that these students feel dignity. And, you know, more often they'll they feel like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't, because that has been ingrained in their, through their life. I can't, I can't. But we want to make sure that these students feel like that they can, and we can bring them up, and that was going to apply for their life in the future, and change that perception and their experience around their livelihood. So with this photo, there's actually four pictures here, and it actually explains the journey of different educational environments for students that have disabilities. And this has been going on for quite a while. One country could have all four of these or maybe some of these. And I'm going to walk through each one of these photos. Uh, quite a while back, many years ago, uh, they tend to have the first exclusion where in the center and they had regular boys and girls without a disability. Of course, they would go to school, but the different kinds of disabilities are outside of that circle. And they didn't go to school at all. They didn't get any kind of education. They were just left out. They would stay at home with their parents or work on a farm or maybe even an orphanage. They had nothing, no access. Uh, people started to recognize that these kids have equal rights to education as well. They need to be able to go to school. So uh, maybe religious institutions, government, state schools, uh, they actually set those up, but it was segregated. And that's the second picture where there's segregation. And the children without disabilities were still together. And then the children that have disabilities were in separate schools. Schools for children that have disabilities or school for intellectual disabilities or blind, deaf, whatever. But it was actually segregated at that point. Uh, then people had started to, um, after the civil rights movement here in the United States, uh, they recognized that being segregated is separate but not ne equal, necessarily equal. So uh, they had this new model, the next one, it's called integration. And that idea is where one school would have children without disabilities in one area, and then they would put children that have disabilities in that school and that would be good enough. But realizing that the key difference between integration and inclusion, which is the last picture, is the integration, it just is physically there. They just put the kids in the school. The teachers didn't get appropriate training, uh, the materials, it, it didn't have regular adaptations. Uh, maybe the students around there uh, didn't know how to either communicate with students with disabilities. They were just put there physically in that cell and they thought the problem was solved. Well, that didn't work. Inclusion, actually, that's really a huge change. It changes everything about how education system functions now. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone from the top to the bottom and all in between actually is included in these different approaches. 
uh, an understand of how children with disabilities can be in included. Uh, I'll go a little bit more on that later. So uh, here in this toolkit, you'll actually see, now I'm not gonna go really in depth here, but you'll find this in this toolkit, that there's actually different characteristics of what inclusion means. So for example, you wanna make sure that children with disabilities are uh, in a school that's near their home, uh, that their teachers are actually trained to be able to support these students and students that are in age-appropriate classrooms. As you can see, these two different, what is supposed to be and what's not supposed to be included. So you can look at that more uh, within the toolkit. So one unique, and there's, exception, there's one exception to everything, is to the concept of inclusion. That really is a big, it tends to be a, a pain, it's a pain point in moving forward for inclusion, especially the deaf community. And the reason why is because the deaf community really has their own language and culture. So many people think that uh, children with a disability, that's fine, we can just include them in the school. But for many deaf and hard of hearing children, when they go into these, often that's going to mean that they're going to be alone. They think about how they're experiencing these in the classroom. They can't actually directly communicate with other peers that are around them. They can't communicate with the teachers. All this information is coming through an interpreter if they're lucky. So an interpreter trained, some of the interpreters aren't trained in a lot of countries that they're not. And if they do have an interpreter, that's not, that doesn't necessarily mean the student is getting the full information access that's for good education. So we just want to make sure that you think about what inclusion of deaf children mean. Make sure you're clear about how to transition and how that's for children who are deaf and hard of hearing. Options can include uh, inclusive schools, classrooms, and what it would look like for deaf and hard of hearing could be uh, co-enrollment or day schools. Uh, and what those look like are, and how it's different than regular school, is the co-enrollment school may could include bilingual schools, where most of the day they're taught directly with sign language, direct education, and they would have hearing students in that school as well. And maybe the hearing students would have maybe one or two classes that are separate that they would have orally, they're orally taught. Um, and then in that classroom, maybe they would have uh, interpreter in the back of the room to be able to voice for the hearing student, but the primary mode of communication is going to be sign language in that, in the day school, in that, and the day school is the same idea. It's more for deaf students, so that's very unique, and I want you to remember, remember that. So education is just a service. It's not a place. So education really happens everywhere, and we encourage uh, these different students to be able, we need to meet all of their needs and to make sure that we uh, get their literacy skills and impact their employment opportunities in the future because it actually goes on throughout their whole life, uh, as we all know. And the last quote I just wanted to show, share from you from Stephen Hawking. And I often think of this because maybe the next Stephen Hawking is somewhere out there right now in a developing country. And maybe they don't have that access to education and that's not fair. So they would get, we're going to miss that opportunity for that brilliance. So the quote says, we have to focus on things that disabilities don't prevent you to do, but focus on what you can, what it can do. For me, that session, the summary of that session, I'd like to ask you people that are on today, uh, what can you, can you type in the chat box? and rank your country uh, one to five and think in your country, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't match the UDL, you aren't practicing that is number one. And then five is yes, you are practicing the UDL. So we have one, Cambodia three, in some places in the United States, it could be one to five, just depending on where it is. If you don't mind, some of you can discuss how can uh, the program be built on what you've what's already happening in your in the landscape using this toolkit how can uh, your program be built on what's already happening now so teacher training presents a good opportunity to embrace the udl principles that's a really good point leah anyone doing teacher trainings right now other person from Malawi says uh building up momentum uh in the udl or, with challenge or is challenging and it ranks their country too in terms of alignment with the UDL. 
Thank you for that. There's a few main points I'd like to talk about. The UDL toolkit for ev is for everyone. Remember, it's not just for student disabilities, even though it does have an in-depth tools and resources for students with disabilities, but it really can be applied to all students. And whatever is being built from what's in this toolkit will actually impact other students that do not have disabilities. Uh, the second, thank you, Rwanda. Looks like you did add something. Still not discussing the UDL, but now you're going to actually focus on that. Thank you. Uh, the toolkit uh, resources that can be used uh, in your program, and I hope that you can actually uh, look at that and apply it. Uh, the literacy really should become more flexible um, and allowing for multiple meanings of expression, representation, action. Uh, and I hope that this can actually be applied to more programs to improve these learning outcomes for students that do have disabilities. Uh, and with that, then I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Anne Haynes, and she'll actually talk more about the holistic support. Anne, if you don't mind. Great. And so what I'm going to talk about, what we call holistic supports. And when we talk about that children with disabilities should be included in general education systems, but they should be given the supports and services that they need, this sort of session talks about what those supports and services are. So this is a figure that we have in the toolkit, and it goes through a lot of these supports and services. Was we wanted to show the range of supports and services. So it's, it's unrealistic that most countries have all of these issues. Reality, some, most countries have something. Um, every country I visited have some programs and some services that are working. The reason we gave you the gold standard is we wanted you to be able to see what it should look like. What's happening that may not be aligned, how you can reconfigure so that it, as well as when you build up from the beginning, how do you build it correctly? It includes policies and strategies, teacher training, tiered levels of support, instructional approaches, other related services, as well as who should be engaged in this process. So one of the key issues is policies. The toolkit uses the CRPD as our guideline for inclusion. The CRPD has an article on education and they also talk about in the comments that you cannot have a parallel, two parallel systems. You cannot have segregated education and be aligned with the CRPD. In Ghana, for example, they created a policy that says you can segregate children who are perceived as having severe disability. And I think that's going to be a problem down the road because uh, it serves as a barrier, it serves as discrimination versus say Liberia, which has a much more inclusive policy, probably very unrealistic to meet at this point, but it shows what it's moving towards, national education strat strategic plans to outline how you're gonna slowly, progressively get to that. So the next issue we have here is teacher training. We have, um, you know, we'll talk about teacher attitudes, and I'm not going to go through all of these issues. I'm just going to focus in on a couple of things, talk about uh, more about the hierarchy. In the toolkit, we talk about teacher attitudes. Teacher attitudes can serve as a barrier. We talk about role in principal administrators, importance of multi-tiered support. So one of the things we have here is the importance of tiered level supports. This is really to understand that all general education teachers just have some level of inclusion also have special education teachers. I think that if you train your general education teachers, you don't need special education teachers. Then we also have technical experts. These are Braille experts, you know, people that know sign language. Often people think that this is not a reality in a lot of the countries in which we work, but actually these, these experts do exist. They just often in segregated schools. So next we're going to talk about instructional approaches and teachers. And again, we don't go through all of these, but these important things that kids often need with disabilities. Education plans, access to curriculum, reasonable accommodation, assistive technology. So for individual education plans, uh, it's important to note that these are going to be different in all the countries that we work. It's important that they try to set goals, that they work on strengths, they articulate most importantly what accommodation so access to the curriculum. What's important here is that in many countries what we work, we allow children to have access to the curriculum. And essentially in the toolkit, we have three different types that we discuss. One is an adapted curriculum. You have the same person learn the same a child, for example, who is blind, has the same curriculum, but it's adapted because they get their materials in Braille. 
Another curriculum would be um, augmented curriculum, where it's the same curriculum, but you have additional support. So for example, children who are deaf have the same curriculum, but they may also get deaf culture as an additional course, or children who are blind may also get mobility and orientation, modified. And that's understanding that it's the same curriculum, but it might be different based on that child's needs. For example, if you're teaching vocabulary and you have a child with a learning disability that struggles with vocabulary or children with an intellectual disability, kids may be learning 40 new vocabulary words. This child may only be 10 to 15, maybe 10 to 15 based on where they are. Uh, one thing that's really important is there's often up to alternative curriculum. You have a child with a disability that learns something entirely different. In a lot of countries, for example, children who are deaf, learn, they learn literacy instead of learning like P1 and having the same curriculum, that's broken up into two terms. So at graduation, they have half the same of the curriculum as all other students without disabilities. Children with intellectual disabilities, where children who are blind or children who are, have a learning disability or intellectual disability can learn colors or just alphabet. They don't actually get to learn literacy skills. About children and their capacity doing alternative curriculums, that sets their capacity. It's not their individual capacity that's set. It's not that they can't learn literacy. It's that we're not giving them the opportunity to learn. We talk about reasonable accommodations. I won't go through this all, but it talks about what an accommodation isn't. So some children may need additional time. Some that doesn't mean you give them the answers in advance. So we have to explain what those accommodations can be. Um, so we talk about assistive technology. And one of the things I really want to talk about here is that assistive technology is a really good tool for UDL in the classroom. It can help change motivation. It can help ch children receive information, express information. But it's not the magic wand. Teacher training is still needed. And, and also, teacher, you need to train the teachers on that assistive technology. So I want to show a couple of technologies that are out there. Some of these are more prevalent in certain countries than others. One is the Brailler. You can see that's essentially it's a typewriter that you can use and it types out Braille. The next is called Assistive Augmentative Communication. On this one, it's actually, you can see it's using an iPad, but this can also be low tech and can be pieces of paper. And this is where children can point to symbols to help them learn to speak. Then we have an FM system. And essentially what it is, is where you can put in headphones and allow for the teacher to talk into a device and someone with low hearing can hear it clear. So it's an alternative if hearing aids aren't available. Then we have magnifying glasses, um, where a child can, instead of making everything large print, which can be very expensive, sometimes a $5 magnifying glass can do that instead. So the next topic we talk about is other related supports. And again, we have a lot there, but we'll keep going on to teach. Can we move to the next slide? Teacher assistance is one of those supports that is very helpful for a lot of kids. Um, what they are not is interpreters for children who are deaf, but more for children that need additional support to help them stay on focus. This is something that has, we talked about innovation coming from low and middle income countries. I've seen some really great experiences. For example, um, teacher assistance in, in Ghana, where they have parents who can't go to school, can't work because their child is not allowed to go to school. When they get them into school, they're actually becoming the teacher assistants. And that's sometimes they slowly begin to get funding and so it becomes another income for the family. So the next I want to talk about is accessible transportation. Accessible transportation can be a main barrier for inclusion. Often we think of infrastructure where we think of if we put a ramp in, but in reality, about 95% of children with disabilities can actually get into those schools. They just can't participate um, because there's inflexible curriculum or teachers aren't trained or they don't have access, they're not allowed. But accessible transportation can benefit many children with disabilities because actually the lack of that accessible transportation is one of the main concerns for parents about being able, why they don't send their kids to school. There's concerns that there could be violence, sexual abuse going to and from school. And so really addressing this in our programs are really important. So in this picture, we have, you know, a yellow school bus and a uh, looks like a, a girl going in by a wheelchair. And this is really a, a high income version of accessible transportation. Uh, what I don't have here is some pictures of what we were able to find in the toolkit, which is this is not what accessible transportation means in low and middle income countries. There's a lot of really innovative ways to get kids to and from schools 
that's not a school bus. One country did three wheelers. Another country, you know, came together and paid for kids to sit in the back of a pickup truck. So there's a lot of innovative ways to get kids to school. It just may not look what it looked like in the US. Um, the next slide we talk in this session of the toolkit, we talk about who should be a part of this. We talk about self-determination, and that's a term that means that children with disabilities are active participants in their own education. We talk about family engagement, and you'll note here we use the word family and not parents because it can be siblings, it can be grandparents, that families can be very different in the countries in which we work. Then we have DPO um, engagement and community engagement as well. So I'm just going to talk about DPO engagement here because I think it's a really important aspect that I'm sure we've talked, Josh and the team have talked about many times. But one article in the CRPD is that per persons with disabilities need to be brought in on all projects related to persons with disabilities. But I actually think they need to be brought in for all projects because they have a valuable voice. So that means bringing them into the design, bringing them in as participants, as well as evaluation. Too often, I think, when we bring people in, it's been as beneficiaries, but there's a great voice and a very needed voice to help guide our programs. Um, so this is the motto from the disability community worldwide, which is nothing about us without us. And so it's really important that we do this and keep these educational services. Um, and we, research shows that when involved, educational services are improved. So that's um, it on our end. We want to see, first of all, are there any questions about this information? And maybe I could put out a question to kind of start the discussion. Um, does anyone want to talk about what holistic supports might be currently available in their countries? Have they seen any of the things that we've mentioned? Has this been something that's maybe been addressed in any of the projects? So I'm not seeing any comments on chat right now. Josh or Rebecca, do you have anything to add? So we have Mary. I'm not sure what country, but it says other types of supports in the school environment is peer-to-peer -peer support and support in the classroom, especially in situations with teacher assistance. As Josh mentioned, too, that talked about children who are gifted, often children are, who are, who are really understand, oh, thank you, Mary from, from Malawi, often children who, who do very well can be bored with the curriculum. And so the one great thing to do is to use those peers that really understand that content to serve as peer tutors and peer mentors. Um, and so it helps both children. And I think, uh, Rebecca, you also brought up a good thing. This is really holistic. It's, we're trying to show the whole picture, but in reality, we don't expect this to happen overnight. It's going to be progressive, but a lot, every country where I've been, there's something going on. There's, they're, they're doing something in this realm of holistic support. So there's something to be built upon. But there's also some times where they're doing things that may not be aligned with the practice. So, I think if you're looking to build, the first thing is, is to use that toolkit as a guide, look to see what's happening in the country, look to see what the research shows it should be like. And I would start with retrofitting the programs that exist to make sure they're aligned, and then slowly look based on priorities of the government and priorities of the DPOs, begin to be able to fill those other holistic supports in us. Just to sum up, and I think that in a way is a sum up, there's a lot of different services that kids with disabilities may need. It usually is individualized. Not all supports help the same children with the same disability label in all ways. So it's how do we look to see what those kids need and how we support them. The toolkit provides a very comprehensive guide for people to look at in order to compare where their countries are and where their countries need to be. Um, and so I'd really recommend that people look at that, right, and if they have questions they can reach out to, to Josh and his team. So now I'm going to give it over to our next speaker, who is Rebecca. Thanks so much, Anne. I just want to say I'm really grateful to see people like Mary and Noura and Odala and everybody else that we have. Obviously, Satya Wale and then our Washington colleagues, Laura Brooks, Deirdre. But especially now, the question I want to ask is just for people joining us from the field. So if you're from Washington, please don't answer this. If you are in the field, does anyone know where this toolkit can be found? Where can you find this toolkit we are talking about? If you know where to find the toolkit, feel free to type it in the chat. GRN, yes, the URC Reach for Reading GRN website has the toolkit. That's a good place. Good job, Nora. Any other ideas? Google will get you there. <laughs> That's great, Catherine. Um, yes, I think Google will get you there. So please feel free to use Google. And we'll, there's one other thing that we could think about. Um, anyone, it starts with an E, 
So you can also find it on USAID's EduLinks site. Uh, if you don't have anywhere else to go, USAID maintains a site called EduLinks, and there are lots of resources there, and this is one of them. And it is an extensive uh, toolkit, so this webinar is just meant to orient you to the main ideas, but please, we encourage you to go find the toolkit and uh, think about all of these things again after this. So with that said, I'm going to head into our session on uh, from theory and into practice which really is directed at us at USAID and at other donor organizations that have the ability to sponsor this work. Do's and don'ts of funding, let's jump right in. So I think we all know this, at least everybody on the phone I think is already in one way or another thinking about how to orient USAID monies toward uh, the use of universal design for learning in all of our work, whether we're in a crisis and conflict situation or some other transitional developing situation. Um, and what you need to know is that you're in good company if you're at a USAID desk and you're thinking of doing that. What you see on the slides are all of our other donor colleagues uh, that are working to bring money towards the use of universal design for learning and really try to apply these principles that Josh and Ann have been talking about in the things that we fund. Um, and you'll see on your slide as well, there's a mention of the GLAD network. So um, this is an entire network of, of specialists and, and um, interested parties and, and in some cases foundations, donors, others with uh, the ability to sponsor work in this area. And so please feel free to jump on their website as well and learn all about them. But they're also helping to push this uh, agenda out into schools and out into programs. So how are we going to do this? Because it's one thing to sit in Washington and chat about it. It's quite another, as I know that uh, Odala and Nora and Mary and Wale and Satya all know, it's quite another to be um, in a place that really doesn't have a system that's doing much of this yet and to think about creating change. Uh, so what the toolkit recommends is this twin track approach. And so what you can see on your slide is that on the left hand side, we have some of what has really kind of traditionally been happening to some degree in some places. This idea that when we design a program, we're, we're designing with all the good principles of inclusive development in mind. And you know, that's a pretty broad statement, it crosses humanitarian programs, development programs, programs in our sector, cross sectoral work. Just the idea of having inclusive development at the core of the considerations of our funding. So what are we going to need to put into any program to ensure that people with disabilities can access the services that program supports? On the right, you have a slightly different circle, which is a little bit more what some of the colleagues on the um, webinar have done, which is to design and implement disability specific interventions. So really, targeting the money you have and the work you're designing and what you're trying to do so that you're sure that you're reaching sort of first and foremost almost the populations of disabled learners that that need that extra support to be able to integrate with whatever the system where you are has to offer and so what we want to do is to try to move forward in both of these directions because of course we program in a really complicated context and we may or may not be able to do a disability specific intervention right now today. We might need to plan to do that in a year. But while we're working toward doing that, we can always be doing what's in the circle on the left, which is trying to keep the inclusive development principles alive in any program that we're doing, independent of the constraints that we might be feeling from mission directors, program officers, and so forth. So some of you have seen this, but it's always a good reminder. And it sort of starts with you, right? You're the person making decisions for the US Agency for International Development. You're the person deciding what will be funded and how. So you need to be thinking both about the model you're using in your own head and the model that you're building into your program for how you're going to address disability access and rights and quality and learning issues and the education sector. Um, the slide you have shows you three possible models please type in the chat box the one that you will commit to use. Okay, Catherine says social. Social from Leah Maxson. Brooke, great. Nora, yay. So we got, we got a resounding uh, response there for social and that is the right answer. Um, and it's obvious when you read it why it's the right answer, it's just that it's very hard to do because the social model asks you to actually look at what needs to be reshaped from a societal perspective and not what needs to be 
in any way altered about the person that you're looking to provide services for. So it takes a lot more thinking about your system and your culture and your society when you're doing your program design to try to think about what is the best way to leverage the social model for your programming needs. And the toolkit has information for you on that. So this is a bit of a summary of what I just said. But the last two parts are the last two bullets are the ones I haven't addressed yet. So really, we are at this kind of interesting turning point in the sector globally. It's true there's the twin tracks approach, and we can keep that in mind when we're working as USAID personnel. Obviously, we can be really careful about our analyses and our design and our implementation so that we're really leveraging the power of the social model of education in this space. But what's really super interesting is that the countries where we're all working have this opportunity to leapfrog forward. Uh, there is in the world a lot of information and a lot of dedicated expertise to how to design programs that really do use the principles of the Universal Design for Learning framework. And if we do this right, and if we put our power as USAID behind sponsoring that in the places where we are, even at a moderate scale to begin with, we might really see a leapfrog effect where we can actually move faster than other countries who have taken a slower path toward applying the framework. And obviously, the last part is very important. Uh, we do need to really associate from the outset, and we all tell each other this in trainings, but we do need to be thinking about the research and learning that can come from our work in this space around education for children with disabilities, um, so that we're, that we're really building evidence program, evidence-based programming and um, finding out what the evidence base is in our context, but without reinforcing segregation or discrimination or causing any stigma to attach to any children. So you need to be very careful of your monitoring evaluation designs right from the start. So you will find in this chapter, uh, which is chapter four of your toolkit that you can find on EduLinks or Google or the GRN website, a long list of do's and don'ts for your funding work. And the do's and don'ts are organized in these five areas. So general inclusive education, do's and don'ts, identification of students with disabilities, do's and don'ts, teacher training, do's and don'ts, educational supports, do's and don'ts, and promoting literacy skills, do's and don'ts. So you can see here that there are some really good guidelines in the toolkit for you in terms of what you're trying to sponsor, what you're trying to design, what you're trying to fund, what you're trying to evaluate. So this idea that Josh was talking about before with do support programs that provide inclusive educational settings and don't support initiatives that reinforce segregating students in ways that are harmful to them. And Josh did have a sort of a, a footnote on that, an important one, which is that, you know, sometimes you need to be thinking about sort of the co-educational aspects or what you need to do for a certain group of learners so that they are in an inclusive setting, but they're getting services from a teacher that's best able to communicate with them. And Josh's example was for children who are deaf and hard of hearing. Obviously, the language they are going to use, hopefully, the most when they're very small is sign language, if we can encourage its, its development. And so you would want them in touch most of their school day with a teacher who could sign. And so maybe you're going to need to have them in an environment in the school where that's happening and that's maybe not going on as frequently for the hearing children. So you need to think carefully about these do's and don'ts so that you can really end up with your best general inclusive education possible. So we tried to give you all the steps and make it really easy, but this gives you, again, a sense of how systemic this work is. In order to really make the social model come to life, we're talking about deep systemic change, and it will take time, as we've all said, but these seven steps are some of the steps that you want to be sure you're thinking about to yourself as you're going through your program design and as you're going through your RFP process and funding your partner. You know, you want to be thinking about all the stakeholders you need to consult in your, in your context, and they may be ones you've never met with before. You need to get some data on your current practices and the current paradigms in the context and the current needs, and that might not have come up in your most recent, you know, work on a CBCS or a PAD. You need to really be thinking about how you're going to achieve these inclusive education principles from the start, while at the same time, this is step four, recognizing that this is a continuum, right? In, in a lot of countries, we're kind of moving across a band from segregation to inclusion, and you might not transform everything in a day. One program might not do all of that work. So you're looking for the moments of opportunity where you can move the paradigm forward. 
Once you've done that great monitoring and evaluation we were talking about, take programming that's been proven effective to scale, addressing gaps in research along the way, and then hopefully, as Luann is about to do, I think maybe we'll get to hear from the Rwanda team or not, share out your best practices and your lessons learned. Okay, so these stakeholders, right? We listed several on the slide. I'm not going to read them to you, but you will find if you begin to talk to the same people you've talked to for a while with a lens about educating children with disabilities that you get rich information that you might not have had before from any of your prior analyses. So that's one thing that the toolkit encourages you to do and talks about doing. And then the other thing is that there's a whole set, as Josh has been saying, there are, there are whole communities and, and associations and affiliations of people with disabilities or people working on behalf of children with disabilities. And you might not have reached out to them in a concerted way before, but in order to program your money and to build your programs to meet these needs, to use universal design for learning, you're going to need to do that. This should sound familiar. Again, this isn't something you've never done. It's just that you're now doing it with a lens about disability and what that means for learners in your country. And so Josh is here to help with that. Leah's here to help with that. Josh is pointing at me. Of course, I'm here to help with that if I can. Again, we want to take things we've done before. This should give you comfort. These are actions you've taken before. And now you're going to try to take them with a new lens. This isn't a domain of which we need to be worried or scared. We need to actually go ahead and get our feet wet and, and step into the ballgame. This is where the rubber hits the road, right? So implementing disability inclusive programming, again, recognizing that things aren't going to be rosy overnight necessarily, but you can check what's happening now in your country for the twin track approach. You can try to build toward the twin track approach in new programs that you plan. Um, and then as you go forward, you can always be thinking about tinkering with all of the programmatic documents we use, like work plans and budgets and staffing plans, et cetera, to keep checking for these aspects of inclusive ed and of the use of the universal design for learning uh, principles and where you see opportunities to make them more apparent or to make them uh, more uh, really dominant, please do. And then uh, as we've been talking about, you're probably, it's likely, that you're in a context where you're somewhere on that continuum from segregation to inclusion and you're moving towards inclusion and hopefully step by step away from segregation. Um, and that sounds so simple and fluid here in the webinar, but as those who've been doing this on the ground know, it's actually quite difficult um, because this is such new work. So we're really looking at, you know, a 5, 10, 15, 20 year time horizon, depending on your country. Um, to get this kind of work done. So you have important questions that you'll be faced with, and each context will drive towards a different answer. Um, for example, should the priority be identification of children with disabilities if the number of students with disabilities in the country remains unknown, right? We work with a lot of people, at least Josh does, who come up with this finding that they really just don't know how many children with disabilities are there to be served. Uh, and they may not know even where they are. And so sometimes you're starting at just that very basic data collection point. And we'll have more to say about that um, in the webinar that, that is the next part of this series. Um, the second question is an interesting one. Do you need model schools? Now, model schools are a type of application that some countries have loved and some countries have not in general. I can think of the example of Egypt where I've done a lot of work and Egypt loves model schools. And if I were going to try to move education for children with disabilities forward in Egypt, I would probably consider maybe having a model school in each region where everybody could travel to the school and see what was happening and really try to make it as inclusive an environment as possible. But that's not going to work for every country. So you're going to have to find a way to demonstrate for teachers and administrators and system actors what this really means. And if model schools are one way for you to do that, then great. But if not, you're going to have to have some other type of demonstration. So this is a consideration you're going to have to go through. And then the last, and the last one is very important. What happens to the segregated or specialized schools during the transition towards inclusion? And you'll find in the toolkit that we talk about the difference between segregated schools and specialized schools. Very broadly, a segregated school is really sort of you know, a, a holding pen sometimes, at least that's what I've seen in Western Africa, where you just send kids who have different abilities and they kind of just sit there and there's somebody to maybe give them a glass of water once in a while, but there's no learning going on. Specialized schools are very different, Cambodia, where you're serving a particular population 
for example, possibly deaf and hard of hearing learners in an environment where they're the majority of the learners and where their teachers are working pretty much in formats that serve specifically them and might not serve a wide range of other students as well. Sometimes, I mean, segregated schools, you, you don't want to uh, support if you can avoid it, at least not the worst models of those. There are some times that a specialized classroom or schooling situation might be needed for some learners. So you're going to need to know and think about, oh, does the format that I'm seeing here have a utility? And if so, do we continue it or do we phase it out? Or how do we work across that spectrum from segregation to inclusion? Obviously, uh, this is something we talk about a lot at USAID. Um, but do, do see and check that your programming is effective before you try to take it to scale. Uh, we don't want to uh, hold back or slow down this work, but we also don't want to uh, go crazy with scaling up quote unquote models that actually still need to be adjusted. So it's really important to think about how systemic change is going to drive your timeline and how going to scale is probably going to be something that isn't going to be automatic. So this is interesting. These are two graphs of the about the research base right now um, in education for children with disabilities. And one is from Africa on the left and the other is from Asia on the right. And I can barely, because I'm getting so old, read the categories. But what they generally show is that the biggest category right now of knowledge that we have is in the general category. So there's this 33% of research that's been done in Africa on children with disabilities and education for children with disabilities that's in the sort of more generalized area and 47% in Asia, whereas there are lots of, as Anne's first graph showed, there are lots of little sub areas that you're going to need to be thinking about as you design your inclusive education programming. And each of those sub areas doesn't have that much deep dive research behind it so far in the developing country context. So to the degree that you can hold money back and aside in your budgeting to do this kind of research, we can really add to this evidence base as a donor organization. And then share best practices and lessons learned. We're actively on the Washington side trying to do this, um, at least for the programs in Cambodia, Malawi, and Nepal that we've financed uh, through monies from DACHA. E3ED is sponsoring a cross-national study so that we can try to start really having our own evidence base as an agency built up and developed. We really do need to be able to share information amongst ourselves and learn how to do this in the different places where we're working. New, and we have a long way to go. And the toolkit is meant to help with that. So this is our last thought on this uh, programming session, which is obviously um, a very appropriate quote from Helen Keller, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Um, and so it's really about how do we all work from our different USAID offices together to try to use the toolkit to push forward with applying universal design for learning in our programming. So thanks everyone. So for those who are listening, if you can use the chat box, what I'd like you to do now um, is just take a deep breath. We're almost to the end. But what I'd like you to do now is think about what Josh presented in terms of the introduction to this webinar, the, the three um, fundamental principles of universal design for learning, uh, the differences between segregated schooling and inclusive schooling and all the variations in between. Think about what Anne was talking about in terms of holistic supports and her beautiful circular diagram of all of the areas that we need to impact uh, to be able to better program for children with disabilities. And then think about what I was saying in terms of the things we have to remember uh, given our responsibility as a donor so that we can turn these theories into practice. I'd like you to type in the chat box one or two things that really stuck out for you today, that really struck you as important in any of this information today. Twin track, good answer, Nora. Systematic change, love it, Wale. That's great. Two track approach from Catherine. So I'll tell you what's really kind of stuck out for me as we were doing this. One is that Josh really focused in his introduction on this idea about dignity, right? This is all about the dignity of the disabled learner and the dignity of that child and giving them what they need to make progress and move forward. It's not any different than anything you've heard in any educational course you've taken in the course of your career. But somehow, as a world community, we haven't been able to really focus on this for our disabled learners 
in the ways that we have been able for others. So this is really about elevating the dignity of these children and finding the approaches and the tools and the strategies and the multiple means of engagement and representation and communication that allow them to be full actors in the educational space. I think Josh's emphasis also on sort of communication and modes of communication, he gave us lots of examples of how you can adapt your environment to take people with differing abilities into account. The change though is to remember to do that. It's very easy. In fact, I'm doing it now as a teacher to just roll forward and not remember to check and see whether you're really setting up something that is possible for everyone in your room. Uh, and so there's a real mind shift that we, that we need to have around being sure that people can really be in the conversation even if they're very young children. Obviously, this idea of inclusivity um, and working towards inclusive education as a, as a sort of spectrum for the countries where we are and getting your data and understanding where you are uh, in that spectrum is, the most, is most important. And talked a lot about things that are sort of local solutions um, and the fact that most of the time, except for when we're talking about one of the technologies she highlighted, which obviously has to be brought in through some kind of government buy, most of the time, local people, as was true in the example she gave about transportation, local folks may have a solution to offer you if you're looking to better include a disabled learner or a set of disabled learners in your programming, um, you can check with the people around them. They may have the answer. Uh, so that I thought was important um, from the holistic support side. Obviously, um, and Wale, you picked right up on it, I was emphasizing the fact that we're not changing just a teacher or a classroom here. We're changing a system. That is the place of a donor. That's what a donor should be working to do. But because we're changing a system, our work is actually multi-layered and pretty complex. So you're going to need to read that toolkit, which you can find once again on Google Edulinks or the GRN website um, to really help these systems evolve in these ways. So I'm going to leave it there. I, Josh is going to remind you about webinar two at this point. I just want to remind everyone that uh, we do have a second webinar and just make sure that you, know, you keep a look for the dates and the times on that. And we're going to actually cover more in depth about literacy support. Thank you very much everyone for participating today.